Um, so for the, the next topic is actually um, every year we have both an external invited uh, keynote lecture and then we also have an internal in invited keynote lecture. And in the past, we've always chosen somebody from the community who was doing impressive work, give a good, good talk, uh, Brenda Milner, uh, um, Jeff Mogul, people who are known to be great speakers. But this year, um, we wanted to really allow the students and the student organizations to tell us who they wanted to hear from, who they were most excited about, about hearing a talk from. And so we asked Jisan actually to do a poll and find out who students really wanted to hear about. And I think it was pretty clear that the person that people wanted to hear, and I count myself in this group, is Dr. David Ragsdale. David Ragsdale is a physiologist, a philosopher, and a, a teacher extraordinaire. I think he's consistently uh, voted as one of the most popular teachers uh, in the both undergrad and graduate levels. So he's a spectacular speaker and a kind of very interesting thinker. So I'm really excited to hear what he has to say today. Thanks, David. Thanks. I thought that was kind of interesting because Ed said usually we invite somebody who's doing some some really exciting work in neuroscience, and this year instead we decided we'd do something different and invite me. So I think that that's a, I think that that's a reasonable way of putting it. And and um, you know usually I start often I start my classes. I was just think, I was going to do this, but I, I often start my classes with this quote from this guy Reed Montague that says you know. Um, uh, and neuro or that studying the brain is about information processing, and it's information processing all the way down and all the way up. And I like that because, you know, what he's saying is that that there are all these different levels, right? So some people in, in, a, in a program like ours, some people are studying signaling pathways, other people are studying synaptic communication, other people are studying systems neuroscience, other people are studying cognitive neuroscience, and so really, we're studying at so many different levels. And so I thought. Uh, for my talk today, I, I thought I would try to sort of span a few of those levels. And, and the title of the talk is Brain Decisions and the Law. So where did I come up with, uh, with, with that topic or that title? And I'll, I'll try to explain what the, you know, where I'm going with this. But one of the things that's always really fascinated me about the brain is that it makes decisions, right? I think that's really an amazing thing. Now, it's, you know, your brain isn't the only thing that makes decisions, right? Or the only part of your body that makes decisions. So for example, your heart makes decisions, right? Your heart can speed up or it can slow down. But, but the decisions your heart makes, just to give an example, are, they're, they're pretty straightforward. I mean, it, it, it does a few limited number of things, right? So if you stand up and walk up a flight of, your stair, a flight of stairs, your, your heart speeds up. Um, and, but it, but what its range of uh, possibilities are fairly limited, and also there's there's a really clear cause effect relationship, right? When you stand up and walk up a flight of stairs, your heart speeds up because it gets activated by the sympathetic nervous system, and that was activated by some other physiological changes in your body, and so it's all very predictable, and we can see a clear sort of cause and effect line between the initial events and the ultimate fact that your heart uh, rate changes. But when you think about decisions that the brain makes, it's a completely different thing. I mean, because, and the kinds of decisions I'm talking about are the kinds of interesting decisions that, that really make the brain unique, right? So for example, uh, you know, I can just stand here and say, well, I'm just gonna lift my arm up, and then I do it, it just happens, right? So I think it, and then it happens. So it seems as if the decisions that our brain makes, um, in addition to being vastly more complex, and in addition to being unpredictable, right? When I'm, I can't predict if one of you is just going to get up and walk out of the room. I can't predict that you're going to do that, and you may not even be able to predict it until you do it. So, in addition to that, the decisions seem to emerge from something else, which is you, right? Your decisions emerge from you. You get to decide what you're going to do. I get to decide whether I'm going to lift my arm up or not. So it seems as if our thoughts have causal force in the world, right? And um, you know, so so that that's really a remarkable thing. You know, we are we're scientists, and we believe that in a materialistic world, but you can't go to a restaurant, sit down at the restaurant, and when the waiter comes up and says, you know, what do you want? What do you, what would you like to order off the menu? You know, you can't say, well, I'm a, I'm a scientist. I believe in a materialistic world of cause and effect relationships, and so I'm just going to sit here and wait and see what happens, right? You know, you can't do that. You have to actually decide for yourself. So how does the brain do that? I've always been very interested. And then that that amazing 
property of the brain, we can sort of expand that out because it has social and even legal implications, right? Implications for our perception of morality and our perception of moral behavior, and also our sense of accountability, right? When we hold people accountable for the things that they do, what's the, is there an underlying neurobiological logic for the fact that we can look at someone and say, you did that, it's your fault, you're responsible, and you're gonna have to face the consequences for that. And this isn't just a, an academic, of academic uh, interest or curiosity, because in fact, more and more legal systems, the court, courts of law, are bringing neuroscience into legal arguments. So, so defense lawyers are using neuroscience in defense of their clients, and prosecutors are using neuroscience in, in their prosecu prosecutions and things like that. And so there's actually an important, uh, uh, I think it's, it's important for us to, to understand that link, or I, it's something that I think about, is that link between the neuroscience and things like moral and legal culpability. And you know, neuroscience is kind of this, this, this flashy thing, this new shiny object. And, and there's, this, there's an attitude that people have that, oh, you know, we used to not understand certain things, but now we can do a brain scan and we can look inside the brain, and so isn't this amazing? And now we really understand you know, what's going on with these things. But I think it's, it's worth it for us to consider whether neuroscience really has anything to offer in contexts such as our moral and legal accountability. So I thought I would explore that a little bit in today's talk. And I'm going to start with a, a quote. And this quote is from a guy named Jonathan uh, Pincus. And it, it's from a book. And the book is called What Makes Killers Kill? It's called, oh, it's Basic Instincts, What Makes Killers Kill? Now, I'll tell you in advance, I've not read this book. In fact, so I, I found the quote in, in another paper. I'll tell you what the paper is a little bit, uh, a little bit um, later. But I like the quote because I think it really, and Pincus, I think he's, in the, in the paper, they said he's some kind of an expert in, in the law and neuroscience, whatever that means. But um, I think the quote is really good because it captures an intuitive sense that I think almost all of us nowadays, and even, even us in this room, even neuroscientists, just intuitively have about the relationship between the brain and decisions and culpability, accountability. And what he says is, so this is, an, again, in the context of sort of legal accountability or legal culpability. He says, when a composer conceives a symphony, the only way he or she can present it to the public is through the orchestra. If the performance is poor, the fault could lie in the composer's conception or in the orchestra or both. Will, that is conscious will, that is the fact that you decide what you're going to do, is expressed by the brain. Violence can be the result of volition only. Volition, again, it could be because you did it, right? But if the brain is damaged, brain failure must at least be partly to blame. So what he's sort of saying here is when we, uh, say, confront somebody who's committed a violent crime or something like that, we could ask, did he do it? Is he responsible? Or did his brain do it, right? Did he act with, with uh, guilty intent? Was it a premeditated act? Or was it just an impulsive glitch in his brain? Or did he do it? Or is it because he has a brain defect, right? And so I, I think that that is intuitively sort of, even, even for those of us who study the brain, intuitively it's hard for us to escape from that kind of thinking. What I want to explore a little bit is, first of all, whether that makes any sense, whether this kind of a conception of the difference between the brain and your sense of self, your sense of volition, and your sense of, of, of accountability, whether there's really a distinction between those things, and what the implications of that are for our ability to judge each other, and in particular, judge each other in a legal context. And so, to, to do this, I want to frame this by starting with an actual case. So there, this is a case of United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, Hill versus Osmond. So this is a case. David Clayton Osmond, in 1994, he shot a policeman and killed him at a car wash. And he was convicted, and he was sentenced to death. This was in South Carolina that this happened. And the, the sentence was appealed, and at the appeal, his lawyers made the following argument. They argued he's, he should get a lesser uh, sentence. He's less culpable because he has a genetic condition that causes him to have low brain serotonin levels. Now, I'm sure you know, you probably all know that serotonin is a neuromodulator, and it's, has, there's some evidence that it's involved in regulating mood. And there's also evidence that people with low serotonin levels are more prone to impulsive violence. And so the argument here, again, this is sort of getting back to 
in the context of that Pincus quote, what his lawyers were basically arguing was he's not entirely at fault because part of the problem is there's something wrong with his brain. So what I want to explore is whether that makes, and so that, that's a specific case, and I'd like to use that as sort of a point of departure to, to sort of investigate some questions about whether that makes any sense. And I, I want to narrow, I want to narrow this down to two specific questions. And the first is, do you, that is this, your sense of self, do you cause your actions independent of the deterministic operations of your brain? And the second is, do, it's a slightly different question, which is do the social legal categories we use to assign culpability, to assign responsibility, actually map onto the operations of the brain? So I'll start with the first question. Do you cause your actions independent of the deterministic operations of your brain? And to start thinking about this, I thought it'd be worthwhile to go back and sort of consider how did we ever get to this point in the first place? How did we get to the point where we think that that there is, some there is some distinction between the mechanisms, the biological, physiological mechanism of the, of the brain, and our sense of self and our sense of conscious volition. So if we go back to the dawn of the scientific revolution, right, while, while people like uh, Galileo and, uh, and Newton were working out the fundamental laws of physics, natural philosophers were also doing something that really hadn't been done for really ever. They were actually looking at the body and trying to figure out how the body works. So for example, this guy William Harvey, he figured out that the heart is a pump, right? It just pumps, it's a pump, and it pumps and pumps and it pumps blood around the body. Now, to us, that is obvious. We all know that. We all know the heart's a pump. That's, there's nothing surprising about that. But in Harvey's time, this was a revelation, the idea that part of your body was just a mechanism, right? And, and of course, people back then, even back then, knew what pumps were. They knew what pumps were, and they knew what pumps did, and they knew how pumps worked. So imagine their surprise when they discovered that the heart was just a pump, too. So as, as and, and of course, there are other examples, too, like Galvani, right, figured out that that muscle contraction in some sense involved electricity. So even the muscles that move your body had some mechanistic properties. So if, if, we, as, if, if the body is a mechanism, as people were realizing that the body is a mechanism, well, how does that relate to, to you, right? So your body is a mechanism, but what about you? What's the connection between your thoughts and your ability to control this mechanistic body? So the philosopher Rene Descartes came up with a, 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 with, with a, a, a model or a conception to understand this that is even today, I think, is really how most people intuitively think about the distinction between their bodies and themselves. And what, what Descartes said is, yes, your body is a mechanism. It really does operate according, it, it's a very, very complex clockwork. It operates according, you know, it has pulleys and levers and, and gears and all kinds of things like that. So it's a very complicated mechanism, but it's a mechanism nonetheless. But then there's you, there's your, your mind, what, we, what he would call your soul, right? Because he was, he was describing this from a religious point of view, but we would call it your mind. So he said you have this mechanistic body, and then you have a mind, and that's something completely different. That's something that sits outside of the body and operates in a different way. And it's important to keep it to, uh, to, um, to, real, to remember, to consider that Descartes wasn't Descartes was including some behaviors as being part of the mechanistic body, right? So Descartes didn't exclude behavior from the mechanisms of the body. He noted that some kinds of behaviors were, in fact, mechanistic. So this, for example, is his famous reflex man. So for some reason, this guy doesn't have any clothes on, but he's, he's still sitting here by this fire. And uh, so the idea, right, is the guy sticks his foot in the fire, and it hurts, so he turns his head towards the fire, and he pulls his foot away, right? And so Descartes said, see, that... That is, that is a, a, a kind of behavior that's mechanistic. That's a reflex. That's a mechanistic behavior. But the kinds of behaviors that are the result of volition, that are the result of our conscious thoughts, those kinds of behaviors are, are different. They're set aside. They're, they operate in a different way. And they operate according at the, at the, um, in response to the mind, right? So his idea was that you have this separate mind, which isn't part of the physical world. It has free will. But it interacts with the physical world. It interacts with the body and enables the body to move around and do all sorts of interesting things. And so this was a pretty strategic 
position for Descartes to take at the time because what it, what it did was it said, it enabled or it said that, that the body is amenable to scientific investigation. So it's okay to study the heart, it's okay to study the liver, it's okay to study the muscles, it's even okay to study simplistic reflex type behaviors for scientists to do that. But the study of the mind, the study of what he, again, what he would call the soul, that's the purview of the philosophers and theologians. And that's a pretty good, that was a pretty good strategy at the time because if you, you know, at a time when if you, if you offended the you know, religious powers that be, you could, end, you could end up uh, in front of the Inquisition, and Descartes didn't want that. So he, uh, he was fairly political in, in his philosophical uh, framework that he created. Now, in spite of that, in spite of the fact that Descartes sort of set aside the mind as being something separate, it was just a matter of time before scientists started encroaching on that wall of separation between the physical mechanistic body and the mind. So for example, Ivan Pavlov and behavior, behavioralists like John Watson started showing that more complex behaviors could also be, like certain kinds of learning, could also be understood in terms of certain kinds of uh, mechanistic cause and effect relationships. So the more we learned, we were learning about the relationship between the mind and behavior, the more that we were encroaching on the idea that there's something separate, something that separates the mind from the rest of the body. Now, of course, as the 20th century proceeded, cognitive neuroscience showed that you really can't understand the uh, complex behavior of, say, a human being in terms of very simple cause and effect learning rules like of the type, say, for example, that the behaviorists developed. Nevertheless, there's this sense that the walls are closing in more and more and more on our sense of that the notion, the sense that we have a, an independent self that, that is capable of generating thoughts and that those thoughts are what cause our actions. So where does that leave us? Do our conscious thoughts cause our actions, right? So this is the, this is the, 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 the sort of the fundamental question, right? Is if I'm standing here, I can just decide I'm going to lift my arm up and then it goes up, right? I can do it whenever I want, and it's I get to decide. So it sure seems as if my thought is causing my action. In fact, it, it doesn't just seem that way. It's inescapable. That feeling, that sense I have is inescapable. So is that... Is there, any, is there any neuroscientific validity to that feeling that I have? Well, to explore that a little bit, I want to describe a very famous experiment. And this experiment was done in the early 1980s by a guy named Benjamin Labatt and his colleagues. And here's how the experiment works. So this is an experiment that involved EEG, right? So EEG is a, is a technique for recording electrical activity in the cerebral cortex using external electrodes, right? And so if I put one of these external electrodes here, it's going to record the electrical activity of thousands of neurons in the vicinity of the recording electrode. And uh, Lebet and his colleagues were interested, in particular, in a brain region called the supplementary motor area. I'm actually going to see if I can get my little, la my little laser pointer. There we go. This area called the supplementary motor area. So in this drawing of the human brain, this is the central sulcus. This is primary motor cortex. That's the main output pathway for controlling movement. And anterior to that, is this region called the supplementary motor area. Actually, most of it is on the medial surface of the cerebral cortex. But in any case, the supplementary motor area is a brain region that's involved in sort of higher order planning of movements. And it's especially important, it's thought to be especially important for complex movement sequences. And in addition, th there's been this idea for some time that the supplementary motor area is involved in movements that are generated sort of internally, right? So not, not, the, not, not the kinds of movements, for example, if somebody throws you a ball and you reach out and catch the ball, or if you see an object in your environment and you want to reach out and grab the object, not those kinds of movements, but the kinds of movements you just when you're just sitting around and you just say, you know, I think I'm going to get up now, or I think I'm going to raise my hand up, those sort of internally generated movements that don't have any obvious external stimuli or external cues that generate them. Now, it had been known for a long time. It had been known since the 1960s that there was this, this 
a signature EEG signal that preceded voluntary movements, invariably preceded voluntary movements. And this was called the readiness potential. So this is what the readiness potential looks like, right? So in, in this, di in this uh, illustration, right, what it is, it's an EEG signal that builds up and builds up. So it's indicating electrical activity in the supplementary motor area that's building up and building up and building up. And then it reaches some point, and then the movement begins. Right? So this was known for a long time, that this readiness potential preceded voluntary movements. And there's nothing particularly surprising about that. It's not surprising that before you make a voluntary movement, some part of your brain is going to start to become more active. But what Labet wanted to know is how is this related to that feeling, that feeling that you have right before you're going to do something of your own conscious will, of your own volition. Right Before you do it, you think, this is what I'm going to do. Right? If I decide I'm going to fall off this stage, right, before I do it, I say, well, that's what I'm going to do right now. And so he said, how does, what, how does that feeling that, that you have fit in to this time course? And so here's what he did. He had uh, his, his subjects sit in a chair. And, uh, and, and he had you know, EEG electrodes uh, recording from the supplementary motor area. And he had recording, some kind of recording device that could record muscle contractions in the hand, in one of the patient's hands, and then he, what he, or in the subject's hands. And then he told the subjects, OK, what I want you to do is I want you to stare at this oscilloscope screen. Right? So this was 1988. The, the you know, computer screen wouldn't have worked. They had to use an oscilloscope. But on the oscilloscope, they had a dial, a circular dial with numbers on it. And then there was a dot. A, a fluorescent dot, and the dot was moving around and around and around the dial. So he said, I want you to stare at this dial and, and keep track of where that dot is. And then he said, whenever you feel like it, just whenever the mood strikes you, I want you to just lift your hand up like that, right? So there's no external stimulus. Just do it when you feel like doing it. But, he said, but then he said, but pay attention to, the, to the, this circling dot. And when that feeling comes over you, right, when you get that sense, OK, it's going to happen now. Just make a mental note of where, the, where the, that dot is on the dial. And then re we'll report back later. So now he had a measure of the readiness potential. He had a measure of when the movement began. And he had a measure of when that feeling of conscious will happened. So, and then he, he was able to line these three things up in time. And this is basically what he found. So here's the readiness potential. And here's where the movement begins. And here's approximately where the conscious thought begins. So, as you would expect, it, the conscious thought to, to lift the hand up preceded the hand actually moving up. But surprisingly enough, the conscious thought happened well after the readiness potential had already started. So the readiness potential typically began about a half a second or so before the subjects actually had the conscious thought that they were going to lift their hand up. So that's a pretty weird idea. It's a very unsettling idea. So think about that the next time you're like, you know, sitting watching TV and you decide to read up, reach out and grab the remote control to change the channel or reach out and grab the beer, right? Apparently, your brain has already decided to do that before you're even aware that you're doing it. That's what the results of this study would suggest. Now, you might say to yourself, well, yeah, that's kind of interesting, but there's a I've got a lot of questions about this. First of all, I mean, this was this was done back in 1980. Three, the, the technology was pretty crude back then. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, the, the time window is a bit narrow there. It seems like there, there's a room here for maybe a little bit of artifact to creep in. And so maybe these results are a bit iffy. But I can tell you that this result has been replicated many times. So for example, here's a paper from 2008. This is in Nature Neuroscience. I think that's a good journal. Take, you know, um, anyway, and, uh, and what these guys did, so these guys did, did a much more sophisticated version of this. They used functional imaging, and they had a different, tech, a different technique for determining when the conscious thought came out. It's the same basic idea, but it was a little bit more elegant, a little bit more sophisticated. And what, in this particular experiment, what they did is they had the subjects, uh, had, the subjects could push a button with a finger in either their left hand or their right hand. And again, the, the idea was that the subjects would just, whenever they felt like it, whenever they'd just sit there, and whenever they felt like it, they would push either the left hand button or the right hand button. And in this experiment, what the, what the experimenters found is that there were regions in the frontal lobes that, that's anterior to the supplementary motor area that were active up to several seconds before the subjects actually were consciously aware that they were going to push the buttons. Not only that, 
but they could use the, these, this uh, pre-conscious fMRI signal to predict whether the subjects had pressed the, left hand, the button on the left hand or the button on the right hand. So once again, these results suggest that in the case of these subjects, their brains actually knew what they were going to do before they knew what they were going to do, which is, is really strange. So on the one hand, this makes absolutely positively no sense, right? I think you can all agree that there's, this is just completely incomprehensible. It's, it goes against everything that you know about yourself, and it goes against everything that you think about everybody else that you know. On the other hand, it makes perfect sense, right? Because after all, a thought can't cause ion channels to open. How could it? But the opening of ion channels and action potentials and synaptic potentials, now that could cause a thought, right? So in a sense, there has to be brain activity that precedes the conscious thought. So how do we, how do we resolve this? How do we make any sense out of this? Well, one sort of framework for thinking about it was developed by a, a psychologist named Daniel Wegner. And he wrote a book about this. It's called The Illusion of Conscious Will. It's actually a really good book. And so, you know, if you've got some time on your hands, I'm sure as graduate students, you have lots of free time on your hands. So you can uh, uh, pick this up sometimes, very readable. Um, so uh, in the book, Wegner basically, to su the thesis, if I can summarize Wegner's thesis in a single sentence, it would be this. This is a quote from the book. He says, we develop the sense that our conscious intentions have causal force, even though they are actually just previews of what we may do. Right? So what he's saying is that your brain you know, has this very complicated cognitive processes are going on below the level of consciousness, and, and they make the decision, and then they're nice enough to let you know what you're going to do right before you do it, you know, which is a very good thing to do. Now, um, so Wegner cites in the book lots of, uh, of examples or illustrations that, that, uh, that support his, his thesis. And he cites, for example, the Betz experiments. He also um, describes situations in which the sense of conscious will, that sense of volition, becomes decoupled from voluntary action. So I'll give you a couple of examples of this. So in the, in the 19th century, um, you know, if you went to a party in the, I don't know, if you went to a party in the 19th century, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think the options, it's probably not as exciting as a party would be today, right? It wouldn't be like a rave or something today. It'd be a much more sedate affair. And one of the things that people would do is they would try to contact the spirit world. That was a big thing back in the, in the, in the 19th century. And, and one of the ways that they would do that is through this thing called table turning. So the idea is you'd sit at one of the, a, t a round table, the, the the people at the party would sit at a round table, one of these tables that has like a single, you know, sort of pillar that holds the table up. And then what they would do is they would put their fingertips on the table as lightly as they possibly could. Because of course, you know, you're, you're trying to contact the spirits and you have to, you know, you, just, you have to touch very lightly to contact the spirit world. And then they would, um, then they would do some kind of incantations or something like that. And then what would happen is that the table would start moving. And sometimes it would spin around in circles. Sometimes the table would wildly move around the room. And, and then you know, people would get the vapors, and they would faint. And it was all very exciting. And that, you know, the party was a big success. And, and of course, but even back then, uh, you know, there were skeptics. Uh, there always are. So even back then, there were some skeptics. In fact, one of the skeptics was uh, uh, Faraday, you know, the guy who figured out uh, that uh, figured out that uh, that electricity and light are the same thing. You know, um, So he was skeptical. And they did actually did experiments on table turning. And of course, what they discovered is it was the people who were using their fingers to move the table all over the room. But the, the point is, the important thing is that the people weren't lying, but they, believe, they just believed in this so thoroughly that their sense of their own volition had been decoupled from their sense of conscious will. I'll give you one other quick example of this. It's kind of interesting. So there's, there was this therapeutic strategy which was kind of in vogue for a while called facilitated communication. And so the idea of facilitated communication was that it was a way of, of tapping, getting into the mind of certain nonverbal individuals, like people with nonverbal individuals with autism or other kinds of, of, of disabilities. And what the, what the therapists would do is they would very, very gently hold the patient's hand over a keyboard. And then they would allow the patient to move their hand around the keyboard and type out messages. 
Now, he, this is actually a message that was actually typed out by one of these patients. He said, I'm not autistic on the type, right? And so this was regarded as a breakthrough. We were, we were finally tapping into the minds of these people whose minds, you know, they had thoughts, they had things they wanted to say, but they weren't able to say them. And now we were finally tapping into their, into their inner workings of their minds. But of course, once again, there were skeptics, and there were people who actually studied this facilitated communication. And what they discovered, again, was that it wasn't the patients at all. It was the therapists that were moving their hands around the keyboard and typing things out. But just as with the table turning, it wasn't that the therapists were being deceptive. It wasn't that they were lying. It was that their belief in the therapy was so complete that their sense of volition, their sense of conscious will, had been decoupled from their, their voluntary movements of their, of their muscles in their arms and their fingers. I mean, they were, it, was the, it was the patients that were typing with the fingers, but it was the therapists that were moving their hands around. So how do we explain? So, so something weird is going on here. It seems as if our, our thoughts are in some way related to our actions, but maybe they don't actually cause our actions. So how do we explain this? Well, Wegner, how, why do we explain that feeling? Where does that feeling come from? I think that's, that's the point. It's like, if I think I'm gonna lift my arm up and my arm goes up, now I'm saying, well, maybe, maybe uh, the, the, it, my brain just decided and then just generated the thought. So what's going on here? So Wegner suggests the following. He said, this is why it feels like your thoughts cause your actions. He said it's because of priority, consistency, and exclusivity. So priority, the thought's consistent with the action, right? So if I, th if I think I'm going to lift my arm up, then my arm, or I, I mean, if, if, I, I'm sorry, priority means that the thought occurs before the action, right? So the first thing is that, that I think it and then it happens. And the second is consistency. The thought is consistent with the action. Right? So I think I'm going to lift my arm up and then my arm goes up. If I think I'm going to lift my right arm up and my left go arm goes up, that wouldn't be consistent. But it, pretty much most of the time, what I think is going to happen is what actually happens. And then the third thing is exclusivity. Right? If somebody else comes and lifts my arm up, then I know I didn't do it. So the idea then, he, that Wegner's idea is that this is how it feels to us. This is the causative path that we, that we sense. Uh, and, and this is this is the real causative path, right? So there are these unconscious causes of the action and unconscious causes of the thought, and the thought precedes the action. Now, you might ask yourself, OK, well, that's kind of interesting, but why does this happen, right? Is there, some, is there some, any uh, evolutionary uh, basis for the fact that my thoughts are consistent with my action and my thoughts precede my actions? And Wegner argues that, um, that this is actually, that it, what he argues is that that feeling, that feeling of conscious will, the feeling that your thought causes your action, is a kind of emotion or somatic marker, right? It's an emotion of authorship, right? So, so uh, when, you, when you think you're going to do something and you do it, then you know you did it. It was me that did it and not somebody else that did it. And, and he, he hypothesizes that that's important for, uh, for highly intelligent, complex beings who have highly complex social interactions, right? So, so we live in this complex social world, and it's important for us from an evolutionary point of view, from, a, from the evolution of our, of our social structures, to know whether I did it or whether somebody else did it. And so his argument is that it's, it's, it's a sort of an emotion of authorship. All right, well, that's a little disconcerting. So it seems like maybe when you look at somebody and you say, you know, why did you do that? What were you thinking? That maybe we were, maybe that, that doesn't mean quite what we thought it meant, right? But um, let's move on to the second question. We'll see if we can couple, sort of link these things back together. The second question, and this is, again, more specifically re related to the, some of these legal issues, is. Do the social and legal categories we use to assign culpability map onto the operations of the brain? Right. So, what, the the reason that this is important is that, for example, in a legal context, we have different categories. We assign different acts to different categories. So we say, for example, uh, we might ask, for example, if a person commits a violent act, we might act. Did the, we might ask, did the person act with criminal intent? Were they, did they, was this act premeditated or was it impulsive? Because those are two different categories of events. There are premeditated events and there are impulsive events, right? Or we might ask, did the person do this because uh, they knew that it was wrong and they did it anyway? Or do, 
or do they have some kind of defect in their brain? Because again, these are two categories. These are, you know, some people do things because they should have known better, but they did it anyway, and other people couldn't help themselves. And the, the, you know, when we start to bring, one of the reasons why lawyers start to bring neuroscience into courts of law is because they want to show that these social and legal categories actually map onto neurobiological categories. So they can use neuroscience to show that their client fits into one of these categories. So I want to th us to think a little bit or explore a little bit uh, the degree to which that makes sense as well. So let's move, let's circle back to our case. So the case, remember, uh, in, was that this guy David Clayton Hill, his lawyers argued that he was less responsible because he had low serotonin levels. Now, an implication of this is that there's two kinds of people in the world, right? There's normal people who have normal serotonin levels, and then there's this other category of people who have low serotonin levels. So people with normal, normal serotonin levels, if they do something bad, they should be held accountable, but people with lower serotonin levels, they're in a different category, and so they should be treated differently. And so if we're going to, and then the argument that, that, uh, that uh, Hill's lawyers were making was that he's in that second category, right? And we're gonna, and so we can ask ourselves, does that really make any sense at all? So this is, these are, uh, these are not real data. These are made up data. And they're from a paper by, really interesting paper. It's kind of hard to find. It's by a guy named Paul Glimsher. And uh, here's the reference. I'll, I'll, I have the references at the end of the talk. But, but, but uh, so, so the reason I'm bringing this up is this is his argument, not mine. But I think it's an interesting point that he's making. So what he does is he says, here are some hypothetical graphs and and again this is just this is just a, these are plausible that we don't uh, they're not they're not actual data but here's what he says so here's a graph that's showing serotonin levels in the population and this is you know it seems plausible that this is what that distribution is going to look like most people have roughly normal serotonin levels some people maybe have really high serotonin levels some people have low serotonin levels and it's probably going to follow some kind of reasonable Gaussian distribution. It may not be exactly like this, but it's probably going to be something like that. Now here's a plot assuming this idea that low serotonin is related to more impulsivity and violent behavior. Here's a plot of serotonin levels and violent behavior, right? So people with um, uh, people with low serotonin maybe are much more likely to be violent, and people with high serotonin are less likely to be violent, and there's going to be some, some distribution in between. So the point here is that there aren't two categories, right? There, there aren't actually two categories of people. There aren't people who are normal and people who have low serotonin levels. There's just a continuum. And again, this is hypothetical, but it's plausible, and, and it's an illustration of part of the problem with using neuroscience to justify legal categories, because it's not necessarily going to be the case that the social and legal categories that we, our society has devised are going to map onto anything in the brain. So that's it. So our, our, our social and legal categories don't necessarily uh, reflect the, the, you know, the distinct categories of operations in the brain. So this is all very, you know, it's all sort of, uh, I feel like we're on less stable ground here in terms of understanding uh, people's culpability. But you know, when I was thinking through this, it's, it started got me thinking, well, why do we punish people at all? Why do we put people in jail for committing crimes at all? And really, in, in legal theory, there are broadly speaking two different reasons why we punish people who've committed uh, criminal behavior, who've committed violent acts or whatever. And they're called consequentialism and retributivism. And consequentialist, the consequentialist justification for uh, punishing people who commit crimes is that there's a social benefit for it, right? So if you, if someone uh, commits a violent act and you put that per person in jail, well, that person is going to be in jail, so they're not going to be able to commit any more violent acts. Furthermore, the fact that you put this person in jail may serve as a deterrent to other people who might want to commit these violent acts. So consequentialist uh, philosophy is a, is a utilitarian philosophy. It's the it's a philosophy that's based on the best outcome for the most people and the least bad outcome for the fewest number of people. On the other hand, the other reason why we punish people is uh, is uh, retributivist, which I find hard hard to say. Retributivist, and the idea of retributivist 
justifications is we punish people because they deserve it, right? And here's the thing. Here's the, 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 the thing I want to get at is that a lot of legal theory is based on consequentialism, but we are intu our, our intuitive sense of justice is retributivist. We all we intuitively feel that people should be punished not merely because it serves a social good, but because they deserve it. And this is an illustration of something else about how our brains work and about how our brains evolve, which is that our notions about morality and our notions about uh, personal culpability are, are very intuitive and, and uh, emotional. So I'll give you, there are lots of examples of this, there are lots of illustrations of how our, our sort of moral judgments and our sense of moral accountability really is very much based on intuitive feelings and gut feelings that we have. So I'll give you one, a couple of examples. So here's an example. This is a, this is a game that's often used in, in, psych, in psychological research. It's called the ultimatum game. And here's how the ultimatum game works. So you have two people in two different rooms. And they're connected by computers. And what you do is you take one of these people and you give them some money. Let's say you give them $10, okay? And then what this person does, can do, is this person basically can share however much of this money they want with the other person. They could give the other person $5, they could give the other person $2, they could give the other person $1. And then this person can either accept that offer or they can reject it. Now, if they accept the offer, it gets divided just the way this person decided. So if this person says, well, I'm going to take $9 for me, and I'm going to give $1 to you, this person can accept that and walk away with a dollar, or they can reject it. But if they reject it, both of them get nothing. OK, so that's the idea. Now, it's not, a, it's not an iterative game. You don't play the game over and over again, because that would change the outcome a lot. You only play the game once. But here's the thing. Uh, if you were Mr. Spock from Star Trek, you would always accept the offer, because that's the logical thing to do. Because it's better to walk away with $1 than walk away with nothing, right? But that's not what people do. What people do is, if the, if the offer, generally speaking, is less than about $2.50 to $3, they'll reject the offer. So they both walk away with nothing. Now, why do they do that? They do it because it's not fair, right? So that, that's a gut feeling we have about fairness. In fact, fairness seems to be one of, the, one of the first sort of moral intuitions that we have. If you talk to a three-year-old, they'll tell you that something isn't fair, right? So this is an illustration. It's an example of the fact that our, our moral thinking is actually very intuitive. And it's, it, it presumably, or it may reflect, certain kinds of evolutionary pressures to, that have emerged in the way our brains operate because we've evolved in complex social, social environments. Now here's another example. This is a, um, I mean, this is a, an exper a set of uh, some work that was done by a guy named uh, Joshua Green, who's sort of a psychologist, uh, neuroscientist, philosopher, um, and it involves a, a thought experiment called the trolley problem, which you guys are probably many of you probably have heard of the trolley problem before. But there are like 8,000 variations on the trolley problem. So the basic trolley problem goes like this: Here's this trolley. It's a you know train and the brakes have failed. So this thing is racing down the track here. It's going to turn this way. And there's five workmen here standing on the track, you know, having their lunch or something like that. And they can't see the train coming because there's some shrubs or bushes or something like that. Now you're standing here, and there's a switch. Now you can flip this switch. And if you flip the switch, the trolley, instead of going this way and mowing down five people, it's going to go this way, and it's going to mow down just, to, just this one person. So if you flip the switch, you are basically murdering this one person. But you're saving the lives of these five people. Now, when people are asked, when people are confronted with this thought experiment, most people say they would flip the switch, OK? And, and when they make that decision, they're making a kind of utilitarian decision, right? They're, they're using a kind of moral, uh, a sort of cold moral calculus. They're saying, well, let's see, five people dying versus one person dying. I think one person dying is better than five people dying. Therefore, I'm going to flip the switch. But there are variations on the trolley problem. So here's a variation. It's called the footbridge problem. And here's the idea of the footbridge problem. It's, it's the, the train, the trolley train is still here. The, the brakes have still failed, right? And this thing's racing down the track. And these five workmen are here. And again, they, for some reason, they're not paying attention. And they can't see the trolley coming. Now, you're standing on a footbridge. And you're, 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 you're like not very big, right? But you're standing next to that. What's that guy's name, Laurent? Uh, to, you know, the guy, the guy who's on the Kansas City Chiefs, you know, the, from McGill, who's like six feet eight and weighs 340 pounds, right? And so you can push this guy off of the bridge, 
and he's going to fall. See, you couldn't jump off the bridge because the train would just run right over you because you're too small. But, but you push him off the bridge, he will land on the track, and the train will hit him, and it will fly off the track, and you will have saved these five people's lives. But to do that, you have to push this guy off the bridge. Now, when people are confronted with this moral dilemma, they, for the most part, say, no, I wouldn't do that, right? Now, of course, from a purely utilitarian point of view, these two scenarios are exactly the same. In both cases, you are causing one person to die, but you're saving the lives of five people. But people are OK with this because there's a remove between their actions and actually physically interacting with, uh, interacting with a person. But in this case, they, they won't do it because it would involve actually having to push someone else off a bridge. In fact, uh, uh, Green has done all kinds of variations on this. In one variation, he, ha he says, well, you have a 10-foot long pole, and you can push him off with a 10-foot long pole. And people are actually more inclined to say they would do it then than if they have to actually touch the person, right? But so it, what it reflects, again, is this idea that we think of our moral reasoning as being sort of the highest level of kind of cognitive processing that we can carry out. It's, it's this very high level that's unique to humans. But, and, it, and it, in a sense, it is unique to us. But our moral decisions are often highly intuitive. You, there are many scenarios that you can present to people and say, would you, you, know, would you find this morally acceptable? And they'll say, heavens, no. I would never do that. That's a, a horrible thing. How could you even ask such a question? But then if you ask them to explain why, they can't explain why, right? Because it's, it's more of a gut feeling that they have. So Green has actually done uh, functional imaging of these subjects while they're doing these variations on the trolley problem. And what he's found is that regions of the frontal lobes, which are involved in decision making, but regions that are involved in kind of like the, the lateral regions of the prefrontal cortex that are involved in kind of cold, calculated decision making are more activated in the original version of the trolley problem. But when they, he does, when uh, subjects do the footbridge problem, it activates more medial and ventral regions of the prefrontal cortex. And those regions of the prefrontal cortex are connected to subcortical structures like the amygdala and other subcortical structures that are involved in our feelings and the physiological responses that are associated with, with our feelings. And so again, this suggests that when we're confronted with these more kind of graphic, more, more personal moral dilemmas, it activates these subcortical structures and regions of the frontal lobes that are involved in connecting cognition with feelings. All right, so let's circle back around then to uh, our quote, our Pincus quote. It, Pincus's idea, right, is that if a person does something wrong, it might be because they did something wrong, or it might be because their brain did it, or it might be because there's something wrong with their brain. In other words, he's saying there's a distinction between you and your brain. But not surprisingly, what neuroscience is telling us is that when it comes to the brain, the composer and the symphony are the same thing, right? They're not separable. You are, your brain, your mind is both composer and symphony at the same time, and there's no way that you can separate the two. Now, um, you know, one thing I, I'll, I'll tell you uh, guys, one thing about me that I'm sure that you don't know, which is that I love musicals. I really, I, I really love musicals, and, and I'm talking, I'm talking about like the ones, you know, classic musicals from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And I really like West Side Story. And I'm bringing this up because uh, I haven't seen the latest version of West Side Story, the one that just came out, but I've seen the original like about six times. So, um, And there's, a, there's a, a song in the original. I don't know if it's in the latest version. It's called G. Officer Crumkey, right? And, and the idea is, you know, the, 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 the kids, they're, the, they're like teenagers, and they're, they're part of a gang, right? And they're being harassed by this police officer, Officer Crumkey. And they're explaining to Officer Crumkey that, um, that they're not really bad. It's just their environment that's made them that way, right? So they're saying, our mothers are all junkies. Our fathers are all drunks. Golly Moses, naturally we're punks, right? So that's, that's the line, right? And, and the thing about this is that um, that sentiment reflected sort of progressive values of when West Side Story was probably the late 50s, early 1960s. That was a very popular sort of progressive notion back then was that it's not that people aren't bad. It's not, it's not the, 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 you know, the person 
that's bad. It's not the self that's bad. It's just their environments that are bad, right? And now, what we would say instead of that is we would probably say, well, the, they're not bad. It's just that their environment is bad, and their genes are bad, and the epigenetics, and, the, and gene development, and brain development, and all that kind of stuff. And so the thing is, the more that we learn about the brain, the more that the more we, we learn about the various things that cause the brain to behave the way it does and cause us to behave the way that we do, and that sense of self just becomes more and more squeezed out of the picture. And so I think that, for me, the, the, the sort of moral of the story, you might say, is that we, you know, there's, as I said at the beginning of, of, of the talk, you know, there's a, uh, you know, neuroscience is this kind of uh, new shiny object, and people are very interested in it. And they're very interested in the idea that, you know, we used to we used to try to understand things at a certain level, but now we have neuroscience. Now we can understand things at a neurobiological level. So I'll give you an example, right? So, so it's been known for a long time that that teenagers are more impulsive than adults, and that they tend to do stupid things because they're more impulsive, right? Well, now we can. Uh, we can do uh, brain scans and we can say, well, look, their, their frontal lobes are less developed than the frontal lobes of adults. Now, that's a very interesting observation from a neurobiological point of view, but does it really add anything to our understanding of teenagers? Does it really help us to understand teenagers to know that it, they're, they're we know they're impulsive, right? Now we know they're impulsive because it's their frontal lobes, but does that really change the way that we interact with them and the way that we try to help them to not be impulsive? So I guess the the... Uh, to me, uh, I guess the moral of the story is that, um, you know, as neuroscientists, it's fascinating for us to study the brain and to try and understand the brain and try to understand more deeply how the brain works. And we are being asked, sort of collectively as neuroscience, to apply that knowledge in areas in which are, in which we have, there are well-established social, cultural, legal constructs. and. Our understanding of the brain won't necessarily, doesn't necessarily have anything in particular to add to those existing social and legal constructs. So the philosopher David Hume said, you can't get, you can't get ought from is, right? And what he meant by that is that things are a certain way, and then we have notions about the way things ought to be, and the two things are not necessarily, they're, they're not necessarily connected. So we can understand more and more and more how the brain works but it doesn't necessarily help us with the kinds of social and legal uh, um, challenges and questions that we ask. And, and this isn't just an, an academic you know, point, because, because neuroscience is more and more and more being asked to address these kinds of questions. So neuroscientists are being brought into courts of law and being asked to testify about various things that are going on in people's brains to provide explanations for why people are doing the things they do. And this may not really help us to gain any more insights, or it may not actually add anything more that we don't already have in terms of understanding uh, these, these social constructs and these legal constructs that exist separate from our understanding of brain function. So I think I'll stop there. I have, this is a, I, I, there's some uh, really interesting readings related to this topic. And so I've got a, a, um, a list of readings here. And if you're interested, I'd be happy to share this with you if you're interested in sort of exploring some of those ideas a little bit more. So I think I'll stop here. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, field your questions. But keep in mind that I won't, I won't uh, uh, know the answers to any of your questions. But you can ask them anyway. So thank you very much. Hey, Dr. Ragsdale, thanks for the great talk. Um, I was wondering with regards to the sort of the thought and decision making occurring in our brain unconsciously before we take the action, whether people have looked into this idea and concept in the context of not taking action, because I do think like most of the things I do in life are unconscious. I'm not really thinking about the movements I make, right. but if I notice I'm making a movement I want to stop, you have to notice it to stop it. So is the noticing also like the unconscious thought that's produced at the same time as you stop it, or have we looked into that? 
That's I don't right. know if we looked into it, but I think that's that's a really so. I mean, will the notion of will involves not only doing things but not doing things as well, right? So I mean, there's a whole, um, there, you know, a field in psychology that's very interested in how people control their impulses, right? And also the very it, it's fa it's it's really fascinating that you can. You know, it's almost like your brain has a kind of clutch on it, doesn't it? So you can think to make a certain kind of action, but then it doesn't happen until you decide to make it happen, right? So somehow the, the, the brain systems that are involved in implementing movements, those systems can be activated, but then they don't actually initiate the movement until you decide to, and then you can, you can stop deciding at some point. So I think that is an active area of research, but yeah, I, I, I think it's fascinating. I don't, have, I don't have a good answer to that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, right, right. So, so the, yeah, so I mean, w one idea that some people have is that one of the functions of that conscious awareness is to give you one last little m moment to decide not to do it, mm -hmm. right? So something like that, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering if conscious thought is not a, um, does not result to uh, just action. Then I was wondering if there's like any disorder that doesn't, you know, either one doesn't make people have conscious thoughts, or if there's a delay in conscious thoughts. So, for example, if I'm going to say I'm going to pick up this mic, uh -huh. and then I pick up the mic, I wonder if there's any disorder that's like I'm going to pick up the mic, but you're already picking up the mic. Yeah. Is there? A I, thing? I don't know. Do you know Ed? <laughs> that's a good. I mean, it's a great question. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know the answer to that. You know, there, uh, uh, there is. Uh, I'll give you something that's not exactly like this, but it's sort of related to this. There's a thing called alien hand syndrome. I don't know if you're aware of what that is. So alien hand syndrome, that actually is caused by you know, stroke or traumatic brain injury that damages the supplementary motor area. And what happens with people with alien hand syndrome is that one of their hands, right, because it, it'll be, say, on one side of the brain, one of their hands will carry out purposeful actions that the person has no uh, conscious uh, awareness of, right? So, so what will happen with a person with, with uh, alien hand syndrome, let's say, is that uh, one hand will button up the shirt, their shirt and the other hand will unbutton it, right? Or one hand will put their glasses on and the other hand will take the glasses off, right? And, and there's, a, there's a variation on that in which, like for example, uh, these, the patients that have this syndrome, like let's say if the person wears glasses and you put like five glasses on a, a table, the, the alien hand will pick up one of the glasses and put them on, and then it'll pick up the next glasses and put them on, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And so in, this is a case in which the, the, the affected limb is carrying out very purposeful, they're not just random flailings of the hand, but these very purposeful actions, but the person has no sense of volition, no sense of conscious awareness. And then there's another syndrome that's related to, uh, again, to lesions in the supplementary motor area or in the vicinity of the supplementary motor area um, in which people just don't do anything. Hmm. They just, they don't, they don't engage in any kind of spontaneous behavior at all. And in the case of these patients, when they, if and when they recover, when they're asked, well, you know, why is it you spent three weeks not doing anything, they just say, it, it just, the feeling wasn't there. The feeling of acting just wasn't wasn't there, right? So in this in these cases in which there is damage to brain regions that we think maybe are involved in the generation of these volitional movements, there can be disorders that cause abnormalities of that. So I guess that would be an example. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, kind of building on the last question, what do you think an EMG would look like of someone who like had the the potential sort of build up, but then decided to not go th follow through with the voluntary action? You know, I don't know. That's a good question. You know, you can imagine that what might happen is that the, that readiness potential would build up, but that it, you know, if you look at the readiness potential and you look, it, it, you know, you might interpret this to suggest that what's happening is that when the activity reaches a certain threshold, then that triggers the action. So you might imagine if the, the person decides not to act, that then the readiness potential would die down and, and uh, it wouldn't reach that threshold. I don't know if those experiments have been done, so I don't know. I mean, they probably have been, but I don't know what the results of those experiments would be. That'd be my guess, but I really don't know for sure. Thank you. 
But it's a good question. Right. And um, I wanted to also ask, do you think that the subconscious thoughts play a role in any of this? Well, I, I think in a sense, yes. I mean, not some con subconscious in some Freudian sense, but I mean, what I'm, in the sense that, um, as I think one of the other people who asked a question pointed out, most of what we do, we do without actually being consciously aware of it, right? And so one of the things is that, you know, we, our intuitions tell us that, that our consciousness is in control of everything. But really, most of what our brain is doing is doing it's doing unconsciously. And and one of the things about and it's not just that it's doing things unconsciously in the sense that you know you have certain habits. Like when I walk home from work, I walk exactly the same way every day, and I don't think about it at all, right? So your brain is really good at automating things. As soon as it knows that certain things are going to be done in a very specific way, it just automates them, and then you just do them in the same way. And of course, when it comes to, to skilled movements, like playing the piano or something like that, if you actually think about what you're doing, you do it more poorly. But it's more than that. So the, you know, there, there were some very interesting experiments done by a guy named uh, uh, Antonio Damasio, right, looking at decision making. And, and what he found is that, that when people make certain kinds of risky decisions, there, is, um, there are all these physiological changes that precede the decision that they make. Right? And, and people who have damage to the frontal lobes, they don't make these decisions effectively, and they don't experience the physiological changes. So what he suggests is that those physiological responses, that feeling, you know, when you're like, I don't think so, that's a bad idea, that that feeling actually reflects complex computations, complex cognition that's going on in your brain but it's going on at a subconscious level. So it's not that your brain is merely just reacting reflexively. Your brain is carrying out very complex computations about the decision-making process. It's just that you're not consciously aware of them. But what happens is you get the feeling, and it's the feeling that you get that guides, that guides your behavior. So it seems plausible that there's a lot going on subconsciously that's not, that's not doesn't reach the level of consciousness, for sure. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. OK. So I think it's time to move on. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Please, just join me. Thanks. That was great.